And we're live. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hi, Sky. And Lisa. welcome, everyone, to the Dark Ozarks. <laughs> and our, our mascot our, has woken up. He has. Our, our topic is Lights in the Sky, which, of course, is going to uh, likely move on over to uh, extraterrestrials. And we have our own little flying extraterrestrial here for the uh, for the uh, episode. Yes, yeah. <laughs> he's making a wide variety of interesting basset noises. There we go. Well, you know, it just kind kind of goes with the topic. It does. It does. He's a sleepy boy, so we'll see how he does. Oh, and of course, for people who may be just joining us. Uh, Dark Ozarks covers a wide variety of dark and mysterious topics related to the Ozarks and the Ozark Borderlands region, including but not limited to uh, civil war history, uh, gunslingers, uh, gangsters, ghosts, uh, witches, magic, and of course tonight, mysterious lights in the sky, uh, which of course also includes the potential of UFOs. That's right. And um, my surprise a lot of people that um, the Ozarks is actually uh, quite a prominent area when it comes to UFO research. So, um, you know, I, I find a lot of people are just really surprised by that, but um, I, for whatever reason, <laughs> some of the big cases have happened here. They have, and and I think uh, some, some <clears throat> very interesting documentation on that certainly if nothing else appear to have heavily influenced pop culture in uh in unexpected potentially unexpected ways so <clears throat> we can do so as we as we have as <clears throat> so many so many things the ozarks are a crossroads and as such as that crossroads it is surprising how many points of connection we see to uh, to pop culture, to, you know, concepts and ideas that are ingrained within just the public psyche that are oftentimes associated with other locations, uh, other regions, but actually took place here. That's right. And, um, and, and not just phenomena, but a lot of things in history, etc., that we associate um, other places really have roots here that uh, people are surprised at. Um, now, on lights in the sky. Yes. What What's your favorite light in the sky story? That type of story that is not a UFO. It is not a UFO. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> well, I guess as as, a, as an intro disclaimer, what we're not going to be talking a lot about tonight is the Joplin spook light uh, because we we cover the Joplin spook light in, it, in, in its own right. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but there's um, Joplin spook light-esque stories, uh, both in Missouri and in Arkansas. Yes, uh, uh, probably Jordan probably being the, the most well-known. Yes, and <clears throat> just the the concept um the that that motif of unknown lights on the mountain mm -hmm. i i love that that concept it is incredibly eerie first of all it is <clears throat> and, and it's not isolated to the ozarks we will say that i mean probably brown mountain is one of the more famous ones back east um and there there's a there's a phenomenal bluegrass song called brown mountain light that yes. uh, that I, I i absolutely adore um it's been covered by a number of groups nothing fancy so i think the most recent to cover it um and <clears throat> there is again just that coming into coming into the ozarks coming in there there's something about this phenomenon of course one of the things i love about mountain lights is that is a phenomenon that that vastly predates 1950s ufo pop culture that very very true i think that's very important um that you cannot tie it to the ufo phenomena uh, 
<clears throat> as being the origin story. Um, I think a lot of them origin stories tend to center around hauntings or um, legends of tragedy for Indian lovers, that kind of thing. We, you know, the see the the typical, and I hate to say typical, but the the suicidal Indian princess kind of story often figures in these things, whether it's lights over a, uh, a mountain or, or somewhere else in the Ozarks, like, the, like a lake. Um, yeah. Reef Core Lake is one example. Yes, uh, and I think digging a little bit, a little bit later, you know, putting a pin at Creve Core Lake. Uh, we have not talked about Creve Core Lake since we've actually been there. That's uh, true. That's true. So yeah, we yeah. we can do that sometime. But so uh, it is. So it's not unique just to a mountainscape. But um, and you know, there's various there's various theories as to you know what's the real cause of them. Um, swamp gas is always the favorite um, yes and most of these occur in areas that are not swampy um very true but um the one that there are a couple that are on the eastern side of the ozarks uh that are not too far from the new madrid fault and, and those um you know sort of the more scientific explanation is that it's seismic tension from the fault line yes um, yeah essentially um, energy release geo um geo right. it kind of releases you know <laughs> almost ball plasma or something that it's not necessarily ball lightning because it lasts longer than that but yeah. a similar some sort of similar phenomena mm -hmm. yes and and i think that <clears throat> the thing that that <clears throat> that to me is very um contextually satisfying is it, it really speaks to uh the the european settlers moving into this space which was a very realistically a, a very forbidding land it, it was it was kind of like the black fork to the black forest in Bavaria. <laughs> i think that's and and you know we're also looking at uh, uh a karst limestone cave region uh, the, of course, the term karst is, was developed in, in Germany on the, the same type of uh, porous limestone plateau uh, yeah. riddled with mysterious caves. And <clears throat> there does seem to be some sort of connection uh, from almost from a folkloric perspective and, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, an aspect, you know, in the 1830s, 1840s, uh, we saw an enormous amount of German immigrants <clears throat> not the not the uh uh might surprise people not the uh waves of earlier uh american settlement moving from the the original colonies uh but instead direct immigration uh mm -hmm. individuals fleeing the devastation of the prussian wars and the napoleonic war uh and coming directly oftentimes directly to st louis yeah, a, a large number, and and also um, in the same time period, a lot of Irish immigrants ending up directly in the St. Louis region, um, <clears throat> escaping the potato famine. Yes, and and I think it's <clears throat> it's important to make note, just in terms of the uh, the historic and contextual complexity of this, many of the the first waves of white European settlement or American settlement of European ancestry into the Ozarks <clears throat> were individuals <clears throat> with a lot of German ancestry, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of, certainly a lot of Celtic ancestry, oftentimes more Scotch-Irish, Scots-Irish than uh, than Irish-Irish, but right. there's <clears throat> delineation there that sometimes gets in kind of beside the point in the fact that we're dealing with uh with a celtic diaspora and uh similar groups of people coming to north america for very similar reasons just at different time frames and <clears throat> i think both our particular ancestries uh were, were certainly part of that earlier wave of celtic diaspora uh, uh scotland for you wales for me predominantly and so our ancestry 
was was landed and moving across the United States uh, prior, definitely prior to the 1830s and into 1850s, uh, mm -hmm. German and Irish immigration to Middle America. So, but <clears throat> all that to be said, layers of folklore that would attempt to contextualize mysterious lights and and do so from everything from hauntings to kobolds to uh you know lost lovers as you already mentioned mm -hmm. yes and um then of course then it's mixed in with the native lore as the, yeah. as they encounter <clears throat> native tribes in the in the region and yes. <laughs> and so you get an am amalgamation of this and then it's only you know later that people start thinking okay is, what's the scientific or you know physical <clears throat> reason for this happening um, right and in some cases <clears throat> i think in many cases the spook light is a, is a great jumping off point for this we still don't have uh effective scientific explanation for this but we know that it happens it's documentably occurring right and 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 that's for all of the spook lights in the region there there are a number um yeah. occasionally you will hear a story of one that people will say well it's not really seen much anymore um but i know there you know there are examples of them where where sightings kind of move in a general area over time and so it could be that it's being seen in a different area and people aren't looking for it, you know, yet kind of thing. It's hard to know. But mm -hmm. typically these are things that go on, you know, for centuries off and on or fairly regularly. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and they're, they're, they're similar, but not exactly the same phenomena as people have seen other places and in the old world um cemetery lights mm -hmm. you know uh things like that um that really just you know don't have a good explanation no <clears throat> hundreds of years ago people would explain cemetery lights well it's it's the decomposing bodies the corpses mm -hmm. you know uh releasing gases and and bubbling up to the surface which could happen um that really not the case anymore that's not going to happen anymore with modern funeral um proce procedures so right <clears throat> and it's you know some some of the lore that has has shown up around essentially will-o'-the-wisp phenomena mm -hmm. i i find <clears throat> contextually contextually satisfying but but unbelievably creepy and i don't necessarily sign off on it my my favorite in the absolutely creepiest um uh, category which would be fun to get into perhaps later is uh the the scandinavian lore about will of the wisps or a portion of scandinavian lore in which it is the unbaptized souls of dead infants yes <clears throat> which um you know, frankly, was was propaganda from the church to encourage mm -hmm. um, participation by by the, the rural <laughs> people. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, and and also, you know, certainly is is uh, exceptionally effective in, in terms of its unbelievable creepiness, as sure. as well as you know certainly pulling at one's heart strength but then unbelievably creepy and we all we all know in terms of pop culture i'll leave it at pop culture that the only thing creepier than a ghost is a kid ghost that that's true you know mo a lot of people really are creeped out by children ghosts i, I have to admit i you know it doesn't hasn't been my experience that's the case but a lot no, of people and, and we we've both had uh, a number of experiences with children, ghosts, and uh, oftentimes not creepy at all. Yeah, to be perfectly honest, um, I'm not really thinking of any that were really that creepy or, you know, frightening or unsettling. Um, certainly, I've, I've had experiences with other ghosts that were more unsettling. 
<laughs> and that we're not children or did not appear to be children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. And <clears throat> but I think that kind of goes along with people's idea of, you know, uh, fear of dolls and just the idea of life cut short, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, certainly there's a there's a tragedy element to it that is <clears throat> impossible to uh, just avoid the reality of that. That right. Is, that is very sad. Now, and I think our, our crossover on this is that we have more than one story of, for example, mother and child or child lost in the mountains and a light, uh, presumably their soul light as a right. little risk, appears wandering in the mountains as a, as a result. Right. So that it's either the light is either the child or often the reverse is the is the law is the legend that the light is actually a lantern or whatever of the grieving parent or someone else an adult looking for the lost child mm -hmm. and they themselves becoming lost and then they themselves becoming the ghost yes and in, in that in, in those versions, you never really hear about what actually happened to the children. As a general rule, no. Um, of course, in the in the Rala area, there is some very chilling lore um, of a young woman and child lost in the mountains, becoming yes. becoming ghosts, dying. As well as, well in, as in Northwest Arkansas, too, a very similar. Yes, one. and there's. Uh, <clears throat> I think I think the the aspect of life cut short. Obviously, the uh, the lore associated with it, you know, especially when that lore is beginning with uh, the tragedy itself, that there's a lot of of devastating emotions surrounding that that may just get passed down. Um, I, I think so. I mean, it well, it's a universal that everyone can can empathize with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think early on, when people saw strange lights, these are the kinds of stories that you ended up with. Um, mm -hmm. It's only later that you know we start getting stories that are more sci-fi related or uh, UFO. Very, very true. And. <clears throat> And, and along with that, you know, I'm going to reference the Brown Mountain Light for a moment. In the Bluegrass song, there's a, there's a line that says that it shines like the crown of an angel. And I think that's a really interesting contextual attempt to contextualize reference uh, of, of <clears throat> associating phenomena with something that, you know, prior to pop culture, um, sci-fi, is, is an attempt to just start making things make sense. Well, I mean, that's very true. And, it, you know, um, when you mentioned that, it made, it made me think of, um, you know, this is not even a 1800s phenomena. Um, I was thinking of the Nuremberg um, woodcuts from the 1540s of things in the sky that, you know, that, look like machines and lights and so forth um yes and uh, the contemporary uh reports of that some of them do reference you know that they must be angels you know <laughs> uh things like that even though a lot of the descriptions um uh, are much more of a mechanical kind of craft right <clears throat> It was that owl from uh, Clash of the Titans. That was a, the pilot. That's, yeah. I, <laughs> Maybe not. Um, hopefully not. It was not one of the higher points of that film, but I still love that film. The original. Yeah. I feel like. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, 
Um, <clears throat> I want <clears throat> this has nothing to do with lights in the sky, but I want to want to just do a, a really short moment, uh, a short teachable moment, paranormal moment. Uh, child spirits, like just a couple of minutes, because okay. a lot of people are really really creeped out by yeah. the idea. Uh, there's a conclusion that's demonic. There's a conclusion that they're they're uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, and I think it's very important for people to separate themselves out from uh, the pop culture references, things like The Shining uh, certainly come to mind. And the idea that if uh, a child dies and for whatever reason chooses to remain in a location for a time, mm -hmm. often, not always, but often there isn't a negative uh, situation associated with that. No, um, of, often not. Um, I, I think I think it just feeds on the on the primal sense of fear of being fooled by something. You know, the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing that you can be taken in and deceived um, by something. Mm. But generally. Um, my experience is that things that appear childlike, I've, I've never, I haven't encountered one anyway that I ever had a hint that was anything other than something that was a child or yes. very <clears throat> innocent or um, unworld, unsophisticated, I guess you would say. Yes. And <clears throat> oftentimes acts very childlike, it, genuinely childlike in the sense of um child emotions mischievous playful wanting yes. attention uh mm -hmm. responding to attention that sort of thing and yeah, very much so and 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 just often um more so than other kinds of spirits seeking affection you know yes <clears throat> things like give people a hug and things like that mm -hmm. and and that helping to contextualize that i think reduces a lot of fear in those situations and of course bringing your your preconceived notions and your fear with you uh and using that energy people often don't realize they're they're essentially using the energy the energy that you bring with you into a haunted location um really functions much like a spell in the sense that you're you're exerting energy um with a with a specific desire to manifest it and if that is a lot of fear and or anxiety and directing that at existing sentient energy within the space it, there's a very real possibility to push back in ways that you would prefer it did not very true just as if you know you can walk into it you can walk into a room and be in be in a perfectly fine good mood and then someone else there just with their energy even not necessarily you know an argument or something like that can just change the atmosphere enough that suddenly you're not in a good mood anymore that everyone's not that experience. <clears throat> and uh and you you may want to leave and those yes. <clears throat> those those types of things happen so mm -hmm. now we're talking about lights in the sky um we really can't discuss lights in the sky without talking about ufo or ufo concept phenomena and i think of course we discussed this a little bit on youtube but just digging into the the community itself the broad categories of uh, ufology ufo experiencers and then uh you know just sort of the the cultural aftermath uh or residual that that takes place from from folks having these wide variety of experiences okay um yeah that, that that's a lot to to divvy up <laughs> the best place to start um well, first, I mean, first of all you there's a variety of different of uh, encounters or yes. observations you know yes. um often people will just see see something in the sky they see a light in the sky literally um yes. maybe something that has more of a tangible form um mm -hmm. and those are the most common you know and so you get these 
you get a lot of reports of, I saw this and it looked like a triangle. It looked like a cigar. It looked like this or that. But that's basically all that that you have. And then then you're left with, particularly now with, you know, all the satellites up there and everything else, trying to figure out, is there something mundane that it can be? Um, yeah. And I think, I think it's very, you know, I think it's worth saying that those kind of experiences are the most common and they have the least impact on people too. <clears throat> very true. Emotional impact in particular. <clears throat> and there's a lot less of the, um, uh, culture, uh, community isolation that takes place from, from more dramatic or direct experiences. Right, right. Even, even for those that, you know, assume, oh, you just, you just saw a helicopter, you just saw a plane, you just saw the planet Venus. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that I think most people can say, I've seen something that I could, I could take as being unidentified and, um, and maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. And so I, I think that's sort of the bright line test. Where everyone's like, okay, that can happen to anyone. And so yeah. that's okay. <clears throat> right. And, and <clears throat> oftentimes we have, uh, I, I hesitate to use this term, but I'm going to use it the, the most objective or level-headed analysis of the, of the information at hand from mm -hmm. folks who, who fall into that camp. Simply the, uh, we're, we're observing data. Right, right. And, and it doesn't have that emotional impact. Observing it doesn't have that emotional impact that uh, some of these more intense experiences had. Yes. And then, of course, in the, the, the second two camps of, of experiencers, <clears throat> um, it oftentimes is much more direct. Mm -hmm. uh, and it takes on a wide variety of forms, but seems to be one of two, either, either very negative uh, or very positive. Yeah, that's true. Um, there aren't a lot that are kind of neutral. Um, there are some and there are, yeah. you know, and, and candidly, my own experience, I, I, I put it in that, that category because I, 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 really didn't have an emotional reaction one way or the other. Right. But um, I, I have encountered a lot more people who had a strong emotional reaction to an experience than didn't. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And, <clears throat> and uh, we'll see. If he, we'll see if he continues. To um, he had a We'll just <laughs> well, we'll see how this goes. Um, if he gets preoccupied, he'll be fine. If not, I may need to throw him something to chew on. Oh, something else to chew on. Uh, but <clears throat> one of the things that I find really fascinating is is a broad uh, observation of the two camps of of negative and positive experiencers mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> it can be very culturally isolating for them. It can, and a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the, the environment that they're in, the people around them too. Um, because depending on, on your circle of people around you, those people can be a lot more open to these things than other people. Yes. And, you know, I have seen a lot of people really struggle when they had an experience that they were very, very emphatic about and um, that it was not, quote, normal, um, particularly if they felt that it was non-terrestrial. Yes. And then um, if, if the people around them rejected that idea, often they almost reject the person as well. Yes. <clears throat> I do think that it's a very uh, common knee-jerk reaction mm 
mm-hmm. to uh, to essentially exclude from the herd. Uh, human beings are mammals and uh, behavior or experiences that are very much outside of the suburban norm ha- mm-hmm. run the risk of, uh, of ostracization. And it's, it is, it is I, I think, a very interesting enough, although it's, it's taken uh, so oftentimes unspoken, oftentimes in the name of normalcy or modernity uh, or you know, this is, this is what happens to normal people. So if it does, if, if you're saying you've had a, an experience outside of normal, then it must be you is really a very, uh, primal, uh, uh, protect the herd, uh, animal nature manifesting itself. It is. And, and, ah. and if that seems odd to people, it's, it's, you know, from a behavioral standpoint, it, it, it goes back to if someone is acting that out of the ordinary, they may be ill, they may have a contagious uh, disease, et cetera, so that it puts everyone else at risk. Yes. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and I think as much as we don't want to think that we're being, uh, you know, subconsciously guided by our, uh, you know, mammalian nature, <clears throat> You know, the 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 gimpy zebra gets picked off first yes and, and human beings apply that oftentimes erroneously to um, behavior uh, human behavior very, very. We're, we're we're not conforming then we are making ourselves a risk mm-hmm. so then you throw in very unusual incidents yeah where do you want to start with that i mean we we there, there are a couple in the ozarks that are pretty um pretty dramatic um, pretty dramatic i th- i think where i'd like where, I, where i'd be very interested in in starting because it's um i, I think there's there's a there's a point of lore crossover is that a lot of native Uh, a lot of native uh, lore, particularly you know what we associate with Cherokee witchcraft lore, mm-hmm. has interesting crossover with uh, UFO experience in some cases, in terms of of odd the odd behavior of nature surrounding the phenomena. I'm particularly thinking of owls, but not limited to owls. Right. Uh- and that, and it becomes almost a shamanistic um, response. Yes, yes, I think it. I think it does have those have those qualities. And and uh, <clears throat> and I think that that it's very possible that. Human beings really need uh, the these elements of purpose and meaning that uh, traditional shamanism provides. Very true. I mean, that's true. Um, uh, you know, quote the meaning to life, the meaning to existence. Is there more than you know, just the routine that we go through? And um, we build up so much lore about what that is, and that gets formalized into religion, typically, or some sort of philosophy. Um, Mm -hmm. And it becomes very um, insular, and uh, it, it becomes, you know, in some cases, a crutch, in some cases, a comfort. Um, but often it's, it's, often it has a limiting effect on people's experiences and, and thoughts. And, and that is a bit counterintuitive to a lot of people uh, because it can be very, those philosophies and religions can be very liberating as well. But, yes. but, if you construct a box that you, you you put 
everything into and you encounter something that doesn't fit the box um mm. if you aren't careful in in the way that you approach those things from an philosophical and intellectual perspective you end up just ignoring them yes by ostrac by ostracizing the, the person who's bringing you that information or just refusing to consider other possibilities um and i th i think that happens a, that happens a lot and has happened since the 1940s when these experiences um really became more prominent i i agree i <clears throat> i think that's i think this the 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 thought process is very important to take into account that there's always <clears throat> there's two sides uh to any phenomena the phenomena itself and our uh associations and reaction to it which of course is is impacted by uh environment our environment it's impacted by our historical context it's impacted by our culture it's impacted by how we feel that other people already perceive us as well as may perceive us in the future there's there's a lot of factors there we something that uh, that uh, that uh, um something that uh <clears throat> sort of our our postmodern era has has given us is a very sterile um environment yes and uh, we'll just keep going it's fine yeah i i may have to put him around the corner for a moment but yeah. um a very very sterile environment <laughs> that uh is devoid of, of a lot of that shamanistic contextualization that human beings have admittedly relied upon for tens of thousands of years and so yeah. say in the last oh 200 150 60 to 70 years it, it, you know that suddenly we we've, we've wiped all of that uh, away and mm. then and then said oh it's going to be you know uh, don't worry, it's going to be fine. <clears throat> there's there's something that that is intrinsically missing when we then encounter phenomena of which we may not understand. We begin. I think we begin the journey of uh, of shamanistic contextualization. That said, we're still stuck within, oftentimes stuck within our own categorical boxes of postmodernism, and so as a result of that, it's very easy for us after having the experience to then even box ourselves in with a bunch of opposing categories and all yeah. of a sudden we have we have uh you know people beating you know confronting one another isolating one another and uh and really aren't able to to hopefully see these experiences for what uh you know are are quite frankly, more uh, advanced uh, or, or uh, mature uh, ancestors might have been able to see it as. I, I agree, I agree. Just as, um, and for just an illustration point, you know, so many um, Native American um, peoples, you know, will refer to, are, are very candid about, uh, the idea of beings coming from the stars and coming to earth and star star children etc yes. um, whereas uh mainstream culture you know says that's crazy right right and <clears throat> you know something something that seems to be fairly consistent in terms of uh <clears throat> A more a more shamanistic or contextually whole approach i'm gonna i'm gonna reference um you know a, a little bit of of cryptozoology for okay. for a moment is okay. and, and and you know because we all know that bigfoot comes in a ufo and 
interestingly enough, there does seem to be some odd crossover in terms of of, of observed lore, which of course then then yeah. begins to to create that that more one to one connection that that we see. Mm-hmm. And the 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 thing that we we you know if you if you go to uh, uh, the uh, the the Uranus Fudge Factory on I forty four, which yeah. we have, yes, and we have. it is amazing. I cannot highly recommend it enough. Uh, that <clears throat> you see a lot of a lot of uh, pop culture UFO references and a lot of pop culture Bigfoot references, which I love. Yes, so, <laughs> that is that is that is part of the fun, but. I remember a an interview with uh, uh, a, a, um, a First Nation woman in the Northwest, and this was on the heels of a, a very it was a TV show. It's a very you know a very Western motif, Western civilization motif. Is it in this category? Is it in that category? Why haven't these things been found? Uh, you know, everyone's been out looking for them yada yada so on and so forth and wonderful wonderful interview um with this uh um middle middle middle-aged uh first nation woman who'd grown up in in the region Mm -hmm. and had grown up very familiar with with the lore and in, in i'm gonna paraphrase but essentially very calmly saying you know i i've seen these beings since i was a child um uh, occasionally we interact with them they are 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 beings that that essentially walk between two different worlds Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes they are there and sometimes they are not Mm -hmm. and that's up to them Right. And, and I've, and I've heard very similar accounts, um, actually in, in this region, um, and not just from first nation people. Um, uh, and, um, that, that was their experience. Um, and it, it really does come down to a much more shamanistic, uh, viewpoint, um, mm. which, I mean, the flip side is if, if now, if you have extraterrestrials with highly advanced technology that have allowed them to go across the galaxy or further, um, they certainly may have technology that would ma- make it appear that they that whatever they are doing could very well appear to us as just being there or not being there at whim. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, the answer there is as, as we've said a number of times on here um from a celtic perspective sometimes the answer is yes to both and and that may well be i mean um because both of those possibilities have the same result right <clears throat> they do and and i think it's important just to to take into account just because uh two points of observable phenomena may may appear to be occurring uh in conjunction doesn't necessarily mean that they are these could simply be True. two points of observable phenomena that really have nothing to do with one another and that that's true or it could be a cause and effect that one mm-hmm. thing happens that then you know sets the other one in motion i mean it's example um that I've given before when people will say, well, why, why is there such correlation between Bigfoot sightings and UFO sightings in the same place yeah. at the same times? And um, not everybody in the UFO community appreciates my answer, but sometimes is if there's something different and strange in the sky, we tend to look up and walk outside and look at it. And if there is a Bigfoot there, they're likely to do the same thing. So yes <laughs> it may be a cause and effect not not a direct correlation not a direct correlation and something that we also need to take into consideration um particularly in regards to to uh to cryptid sightings is that they seem to oftentimes exhibit uh travel patterns 
mm -hmm. uh, almost migratory travel patterns. Yes. That, uh, you know, in many cases out here uh, seem to be, for example, following railroad tracks because it's easier walking. Well, yeah, and you and <laughs> less likely to run into people. Yes. And, and that uh, could very well end up being the same with some trails in, in, in like uh, some of the more rural um, forest area of the region as well. And, uh, you know, the place that really comes to mind is Crowley's Ridge. Crowley's Ridge or, you know, um, part of the Mark Twain National Forest too. Um, mm -hmm. but there, I mean, there are parts of those places that are very um, isolated and people don't get into. But there's animal trails and it would be easy to travel. Not easy, but it would be a way to travel from point A to point B without interaction with humans, which yes. um, I'm sure over time has proved not uh, wise. Right. You know, if you have these <laughs> beings around. So for for very uh, important and I think obvious reasons. And it also brings up the fact that much like uh, ley lines, if someone inadvertently puts their house in, uh, in direct proximity to, uh, to one of these locations, uh, they may start experiencing a lot of activity. That's true, yeah. that's true. That they, uh, um, had, you know, that they might, <laughs> might no, might prefer not to that's true <laughs> it may happen whether they like it or not and it you know it, and i think it's it's also important i think it's important to balance so the <clears throat> the more um mystical aspects of the, the mystical and the shamanistic aspects of the discussion with uh with oftentimes very mundane common sense aspects mm -hmm. you know in the sense that <clears throat> perhaps you know the appearance of, a, of an animal uh has you know a, a a resonant or shamanic omen attached to it on the other hand it might be happening just because you're on its migratory trail exactly and so sometimes it is a matter of what we read into it yeah. Uh, that being said, do we want to talk about Piedmont? I think so. Uh, I don't know whether we want to delve into the Marley Woods uh, aspect of it, but probably just probably just Piedmont. Of course, my my primary notes are on on the Piedmont experience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and, and, and that is the area. I mean, and and to be honest, uh, it, it's it's one of those things that. I, I won't go as far as to label it urban legend at this point, but like so many of the the uh, subjects that we talk about, you know, things evolve over time. And so yeah. um, now it's developed that there is this place in in the air in the general area of Piedmont that because of the the UFO experiences and lore over the last almost 50 years um mm -hmm. that there there's an area that has been dubbed marley woods which by the way does not exist you're never gonna it's not on a map it's not on gps it's been dubbed that that it, it is now sort of you know ground central ground zero for activity um yeah. in much the same way as um say skinwalker ranch is uh kind of blown up in in awareness over the last 10 years um and so this one area that you really don't know where it is at except for if you already know about it uh, mm -hmm. it it's starting to get talked about a little more and talked about on some tv shows and so forth so i imagine yeah. it's going to kind of morph even though I haven't seen a lot definitive, <laughs> much more definitive that there's a there's a basset hound on your shoulder. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, 
but I have a feeling that this will be sort of that next trajectory of the Piedmont <clears throat> story, people fixating on it because people are talking about it. Yes. And and it really it, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting to watch, interesting to document, uh, because I think we're gonna we're gonna see that transition almost into urban legend that then takes on a life of its own. It it has that feel to it, you know, um, which you know I hope I hope to be honest I hope there is more to it than than it that it seems, uh, simply for the fact that I think Piedmont should not end up being trivialized into urban legend. <clears throat> no, and uh, the, the Piedmont uh, UFO sightings of the early 1970s were extensive and well-documented. Yes, and actually, really the first uh, time that some serious you know, study was done um, yes. by scientists trying to um, figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully, hopefully that wins out over pop culture in the yeah. making. <clears throat> I, I hope so. So in terms of the a um, little bit of a, of a spoiler, <clears throat> earlier <clears throat> this evening I, I made mention that it, it appears the Piedmont uh, region UFO experience uh, inspired uh, so some pop culture mm -hmm. the uh, the the way that much of this phenomena is is described uh, on in documentation Mm -hmm. uh, between 19, basically 1973, <clears throat> over, over the, a period of a couple of months mm -hmm. is very similar to how, um, UFOs are, are portrayed in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yeah, particularly in the, in the first <coughs> part of the scene. Yeah. In the first part, yes. The, the, the small dancing light vehicles, uh, mm -hmm. aerial phenomena vehicles, that, that are seen in the first part of the film. And, and that may well be for, from the fact that it was as well documented um, uh, as it was, including by uh, some professors uh, who yeah. wrote about it extensively. So uh, if you've watched that movie, then visualize the first of that movie as we talk. Yes. <clears throat> And so uh, the, the beginning date, the beginning documented beginning date is February 21st, 1973 in Piedmont, Missouri. And in the months following, we have over 500 reports of UFO sightings. Uh, for people that might not be familiar, uh, this is Wayne County. It's heavily forested. There's a low population. Uh, and there's also two giant man-made lakes, uh, Wapapello and Clearwater Lake. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's anything particularly um, unusual about the lakes or, you know, something, nothing that would um, necessarily make someone think, oh, they're underwater bases. You know, of course, um, a big theory now is that a lot of UFO activity is at, at actually submersible um, underwater. Uh, I mean, there's nothing about those lakes that are odd that would you know, make them uh, suspectful of being a, a center of some sort of activity. Right. And the, 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 the craft that is observed um, seems to be decidedly, it seems to be craft. It seems to be something that has in some way, either terrestrially or extraterrestrially, been physically assembled. Yes, it, it does seem to the descriptions and, and impressions of witnesses that it's definitely tangible, definitely a, a physical form, um, and intelligently maneuvered. Yes. So we, you know, the <clears throat> uh, the first sighting <clears throat> uh, 
uh, Reggie Bone, who was a high school basketball coach, very popular, very well known. Uh, he, with two team managers and three players, were returning home from a game along U.S. Highway 60 to nor- near uh, Elsinore, Missouri, 20 miles south of Piedmont. And the, the first sighting was that they saw a bright shaft of light beaming down out of the sky, which is sounds very cliche. The only thing else it needs is a cow in the light. Um, but, uh, but of course, bear in mind that these experiences here in 1973 made it heavily into local and sometimes, uh, you know, more widespread newspapers and then impacted popular culture and art. Right. So uh, these, are, these are the, these are the events that basically created those stereotypes. Yes. And, and the more that you, you go over and as we'll begin to go over, the more of these reports that you look at, it, I think it is easy to say that in many cases of the, those, those stereotypical images that we have in our head, uh, a lot of those seminal moments were right here. Yeah. Um, and more in this, you know, short period of time in s- small space than anywhere else really before that. Um, the only thing else that you could kind of compare is having that same sort of impact pop culture wise, of course, would be Roswell itself. Yes. And so uh, a few miles later, uh, player Randall Holmes says, look, the, there's that thing uh, that we saw back on Highway 60. They pulled the car over and they saw the UFO about 200 yards off of the road uh, and 400 feet above the ground. We saw four lights that looked like portholes red, green, amber, and white. We stood there and watched it for about 10 minutes. Then all of a sudden the lights went directly up in the air with absolutely no notice, no noise, and just disappeared over the hill. That sounds very familiar to me. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Edith Boatwright of Mill Springs reported, and this was just 30 minutes after that sighting, uh, saw a flashing light. I thought something had happened on the road. I could very plainly see a craft just clearing the utility wires. It was in a horizontal position. I think there were people in it. I could see objects inside but could not make out any form of a person. It made a very quiet noise like a whoosh slowly and evenly. When it changed into a vertical position, it made a louder noise like a quiet motor pulling. Hmm. Like a most like an electric motor or something like that. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> this is February twenty first. Uh, on February twenty second, uh, there are more corresponding reports. Uh, an object blinking with green, white, amber, and red lights. Um, individual tried chasing the object but lost it. Um, on February twenty sixth. Uh, two individuals watched a luminous object moving over the trees near Tip Top Mountain. The UFO was about 500 yards away with solid prongs on it and a red light was on it. And then sightings continued almost nightly from February 21st to late April. Most were nocturnal lights uh, or bright flashing lights far enough away that witnesses could not discern the source. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, and, and, it, and if I recall correctly, over a fairly wide area too. I mean, this isn't like Mm -hmm. it was being seen in, you know, a square mile or something like that. Right. Um, And the the thing that is, uh, that, that appears to be very consistent about these reports, first of all, is the, mostly similar sighting descriptions yeah. not not exclusively uh similar not similar to the letter but similar enough uh that i think is very noteworthy and uh and i think in terms of eyewitness accounts it's also helpful that the the accounts are not identical we're we're not it, it is suggestive that these aren't people who all read the same newspaper right and then yeah, just they, were quoting it. 
no, it, it, it does not appear that way. And uh, a number of them were very credible witnesses, too, in, including some law enforcement officers, if I recall correctly. And, and uh, as well as, um, you know, March 22nd, 1973, uh, Piedmont newsman Dennis Kenny of local radio station KPWB saw a big orange light glowing from white to orange. It appeared to just go out and then would come back on. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> <clears throat> that <clears throat> um, on 4.30 p.m. March 22nd, 1973, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Joe King of Mill Spring and Ron Miller of Piedmont, both students at Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau, were traveling along Highway 34 near Patterson, eight miles east of Piedmont, when they noticed an oval-shaped object above the nearby treetops. The UFO, metallic in appearance, flat on the bottom with the dome on the top was moving rapidly and leaving no vapor trail. And, and another thing is that whatever it is, it didn't seem to be worried about, it didn't exactly seem to be trying to hide or uh, worried about observers. No, and that's, <clears throat> there, there's a couple of, of odd elements to this that I, I, I find very fascinating. One, um, you know, it's it's a, a perhaps not unreasonable um, conclusion that many of the uh, the UFO sightings are uh, are classified military. Right, but but the fact that it that the uh, witnesses observed them as many times as they did and and often not not just you know shooting across not like they were going you know traveling fast um, that's not behavior that you would do that you would uh, engage in if you were flying a classified aircraft no it, it's you know from a from a behavioral standpoint or a psychological standpoint if you were trying to keep this tech secret, this is not a good way to do it. No, and it well, and it's it's not it's not the protocol that was used by the military either. So, right, other projects. So, um, it either makes no sense for it to be them, or you fall into the conspiracy theory of they specifically did this to create the idea of it being a ufo um, yes yes and, <clears throat> which, which yeah. to me has always had a, a very fuzzy basis as to motive um mm -hmm. uh, because really if you're if you're doing it to try to uh, control the masses or or that kind of thing, it's not really an effective strategy and you're not going to affect that many people um, and risk just creating more panic and um, instability than anything. Right, and of course, this is also coming off of heels uh, of a variety of, of you know, late 1950s, early 1960s observed phenomena, particularly in the Southwest, that, uh, quite frankly, uh, <clears throat> the uh, you know the official reports uh, appear to be very hastily assembled and a bit ludicrous. Mm -hmm. But very much so. but really point at an attempt to uh, dissuade the American public that they had seen anything of of, uh, of unknown origin. Right. Right. Um, and you, you didn't have that corresponding reporting. You didn't have that corresponding uh, sort of discrediting, you know, things. I mean, it, you know, the reports were just out there, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me that it was a disinformation campaign. <laughs> Right. And I think that's, I think that's very, very fair. I'm, 
<clears throat> there's there's a variety of aspects to this that I think are really fascinating. The the late 1950s um, um, reference, I actually referenced it in, I, I heard a full account at the Eureka Springs UFO conference a few years ago and I referenced it rather extensively in the, the UFO article that's currently up on State of the Ozarks. But it was the late 1950s and in the American Southwest in uh, Arizona, I believe, uh, over the course of several days, uh, formations of unidentified flying objects were seen in, in ways that were really impossible to account for. Mm -hmm. They were they were seen as, uh, as white disks and lozenge shaped aircraft um, uh, flying in formation around 30,000 feet and there were hundreds of them observed in that corner of the state uh, mm -hmm. over the course of about 48 hours. And they were, <laughs> yes. Um, it, uh, you know, and, and they, it was reported in a number of regional newspapers. There were photos. Um, <clears throat> there, there was unmistakable numbers hundreds if not thousands of people reported seeing them and again these aren't individuals who were like out looking for ufos it was you know a bands of you know classes of school kids who were in recess um, right right yeah so, not not exactly um if it, if it was a classified operation you know someone really dropped the ball so um, right and and along with the that uh, the initial reports, the initial explanations uh, provided by uh, by authoritative voices um, said that it was a cottonwood blossom bloom. That would be a lot of cottonwoods. Yes, um, it was at least a little more imaginative than the, uh, the, the discarded <laughs> weather balloon, um, but I think the I think the weather balloon explanation made its way in after a while as well. Well, it it seems to almost always do if there's a lot of sightings. But <laughs> as I recall, nothing like that happened with Piedmont. No, we we don't seem to have that. Um, and it's it's also interesting that for for people who are not aware, this isn't too far away from quite a few <coughs> Air Force bases. I mean. Right, right, right across the Mississippi in, in Illinois, and then mm -hmm. Whiteman Air Force Base. Um, it, it, I mean, in, in the scheme of things, it's not that far away. You know, right, you know. right. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're traveling by flying saucer, it's, you know, just a hop, skip, and a jump. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's just a minute or two down the road, I and mean, it's just going down the block, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's so, like getting down to um, cases. And so, if you compare it to those events in the Southwest, you would expect, you know, some reaction from mm -hmm. the Air Force. Um, yeah. Whether it's, you know, oh, it was dragonflies or it was, you know, or right. swarm or something or weather balloons or, or whatever. Um, mm. But really there was kind of crickets. Yes. And that is, is particularly interesting in this regard. And then along <clears throat> with that, again, and we've covered a number of the sightings, but just the, the overwhelming number of sightings and then to have uh, really no official response that, I, that I've seen. Right, you know, um, you know and, I th I, and I'm certainly sure there was probably some sort of statement of, no, it's not us type thing, you know, it's no. Mm -hmm. No maneuvers were being done in that area, kind of thing. But but as far as putting out a, you know, we think it's this. I I'm not aware of any. Right. Uh, one of the other, of course, continuing just it's it's the same series of events in 1973, uh, but especially you know coming back to the lights in the mountains motif, mm -hmm. and then I will cover a couple of things. But on March 21st. Gene Coleman and Kathy Leach were crossing Clearwater Dam about 9 p.m. They saw an object rise from the lake. 
They were first alerted by a red flash on the leg. Stopping their car, they got out to see blinking lights ascending. Each time a red light flashed, the object got brighter. We could see it climbing, Mrs. Coleman said. It looked like the lights were red, white, and yellow. There was no sound. We tried to make out the shape, but each time the lights went out, we could see nothing. We watched it for four or five minutes until it circled out of sight. Well, of course, you know, that would be uh, <coughs> an early account of something that is submersible. Yes. Um, but it also is consistent with the other accounts with, you know, no noise, that kind of thing, and the lights. Yes. Uh, but it also sounds like it's not something that was fast moving. It's not something that was like, we're trying to get out of here and no one see us because they observed it right in the immediate vicinity for several minutes and then um and this is 60 miles northeast of piedmont and grand tower illinois march 22nd the next day 1973 uh oscar wills operating engineer at the central illinois public service company's power generation station on the mississippi river with fellow employee willie hughes willis hughes um said something was hovering about 1500 feet in the air over the transformer guard it was a round saucer shaped object about 25 to 30 feet in diameter it looked like a high intensity red light with lots of a lot of lights coming out of what seemed to be portholes the lights were flashing and causing a spinning effect i couldn't see any image of its bottom which may have been concave i'm not sure I kept walking and got to within 100 yards of it. I looked at it for two to three minutes until it darted behind the power plant, almost like a blur. Uh, I went north of the power plant to see where it had gone and found it hovering over a water intake pump on the other side of the station. I stood there for a couple of minutes and watched it. And then the object flew across the river and into the Missouri Hills. And within a few minutes, Willis, Wills and his crew saw four jets making passes over the area so so it's, it, that sounds like the military was then investigating like they had seen something on radar or something were investigating yes uh, but actually that that description um pretty well parallels my own experience um as far yes. as so so i think now would be a good time if you don't if you would share your personal experience okay and it, and it, it occurred in the western ozarks on the other side from piedmont so it's certainly the, not directly related to, to that at all but um how he described you know something that, that was circular or oval uh 25 30 feet across that's definitely the size that of what i observed i was driving down a two-lane highway um, headed east, in fact, and it was summertime. Um, it was just starting to go to dusk. I was driving to a friend's house. We were going to go bowling that night. And um, uh, I'm the only one on the road. And I see coming towards me in the distance, I see a, what looks like a light uh flying low and my assumption was that it was um, a helicopter coming into the airport uh which at that point was oh maybe three four miles uh to my south um to the southwest of me and so i really didn't think much of it at first and then it kept getting you know larger and larger and then I realized, oh, that's not a helicopter. And it definitely was too low to be a plane. And so, and it seemed to slow. And I end up slowing because I'm trying to figure out what this is. And it ends up hovering over the road, maybe 500 yards ahead of me. Um, and it, it was just a little wider than the roadbed. So maybe 30 feet, and it looked like it was probably circular. Um, it had a little bit of a dome on the top and a little bit on the bottom with a flat area around the sides. Uh, actually, two pieces because it, it looked as if um, 
two bands and one of them was rotating clockwise and one counterclockwise um, with some um, lights that seemed to uh, go on and off around those bands. Uh, and they, they were seemed to be white and maybe amber. Um, seemed to definitely be mechanical. I viewed it, you know, it was, it was a machine. Um, it looked to be metallic. Um, it didn't have marker lights or anything like an aircraft. And then again, you just needed the cow. A light came down from the bottom of it and hit the, the pavement. And it was like, oh great, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere by myself, no cars around. There isn't even a farmhouse and running distance. It's like, oh great, you know. You know, I, I roll down the window and turn off the radio. There's no sound. There's no engine sound. There's no exhaust uh, uh, sound, nothing. Um, just like it's hovering in midair magnetically or something. And it stays there maybe 20, 30 seconds. And then the light goes out and it shoots off in about a 45 degree angle and is gone in you know, a split second. And it was like, it was at that point, I thought, well, maybe it isn't man-made. I don't know, because I'd never seen anything that could move that way. And still have never seen anything compared to that. Um, and even when it took off, still no sound and no, no Tim trail, no, no trail of exhaust or anything. It was just like, yeah. it was there and it was gone. And it was gone. Wow. And that is, of course, that is a, a classic um, experience. Yeah. It, it is, you know, and, and even at the time I was viewing it as um, this was a time um, we still had ICBM missile silos in, in the Ozarks. And actually, had there were some that were close to a villa, between Carthage and a villa, and yeah. I was um, kind of north of Web City on uh, Two Lane Highway, and so you know maybe fifteen miles to the east, I knew there were active silos. So my assumption was this: what had something to do with the military until it took off. And that's the only time I thought, well, you know, if, if it's ours, it's certainly technology that we don't, have, you know, the public has no clue about. Right. And that seems to be something, you know, a, a recurring theme that is very consistent. Something that is, is to me very fascinating. We've seen several different reports, yours being one of them, um, is phenomena that appears either in relationship to uh, something notable or very curious about something notable. Mm -hmm. Curious about, uh, you know, in, in proximity to, to military installations. Curious about, for example, the, the, uh, the water intake of the, the water supply plant. Right. Uh, curious about the lake. And we've also uh, collected a handful of, uh, of submersible UFO uh, experiences in relationship to other man-made lakes in the Ozarks. Yeah. Uh, including Table Rock. Mm -hmm. And it just, it implies, for perhaps lack of a better word, it implies curiosity. Exactly. That's how it strikes me. Um... You know, and to this day, you know, I still lean towards the fact that it's probably man-made, but, yes. you know, if so, um, you know, of course they say that there's, you know, 40, you know, 50 year lag time in technology from what they're working on to what the public's aware of. And um, what I observed it, you know, I'd say that that gap is longer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Where they ought to be using it for in other applications too. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's now what it what is interesting is 
the of course it is it is an extrapolation or a, a conjecture in relationship to observed phenomena but the the uh, the the idea of curiosity about certain landmarks so for example if you're a you know a top secret classified military pilot in charge of a uh, you know a, a billion dollar piece of equipment that functions like nothing else does what is the likelihood that you're suddenly vastly interested in the Illinois Central Water Intake Plant? Exactly, and you're you're not going to be hanging out there where you know there there could be witnesses. It it's you know the, it, the, the, there's again this is conjecture based upon documented and observable data only, but it's right. conjecture that is looking and seeing almost a childlike curiosity uh, or a desire to observe and, and the idea that in a, quite frankly, from, from an alien perspective, mm -hmm. what could be vastly interesting on earth would not necessarily be something we would find interesting. I mean, that that's true. I mean, it, it, it literally could just be a matter of documenting what's here. Um, uh, just like we talk about documenting phenomena. Um, mm -hmm. and certainly does not seem to be afraid of being observed, um, yes, either from a, you know, vulnerability standpoint or from a PR standpoint. Um, right. and, and the fact that most of these sightings are at low altitudes, um, is really interesting to me because, you know, experimental aircraft are not going to be, you know, flying at treetop level or, you know, that kind of thing, uh, or generally even 1500 feet, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly probably not hovering. Right. So it, it really, it brings a lot of these questions into mind because, well, on one hand, I mean, and I think it's, it's interesting because it, we have the situation where the observable tech, say from back in the 1970s, is clearly still not tech that we knowingly have today. This is true. This is stuff that, that doesn't function like it's not like 15, 20 years later, they come out with the big reveal and say, oh, guess what? It's now available for sale. Yeah, uh, we don't have our hover cars yet. I want my hover car. I but. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be my hover car, um, but at the at the same time, it is it is tech that certainly seems less impossible to wrap your head around than say it did fifty years ago. Like, right? You could you could imagine that that there, yes, it may be classified, but yes, we do have tech like this, and that that a lot of the the observation includes you know it it looks like it's it's made out of metal it has some sort of incandescent lighting it 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 has mechanical moving parts uh right. things that, that, like okay this is engineered this isn't extraterrestrial this is engineered right <clears throat> and, and that definitely we, was my impression was that i was looking at something engineered yes I mean, but then some of the behavioral characteristics don't line up. Right. And, and just the acceleration and everything, um, it, it, it's, hard, it's hard to describe how fast it, it, it did accelerate. Um, and that's the only thing that, you know, is hard to fit in the box of its, you know, classified tech because you'd be talking about propulsion systems that are very very theoretical i mean star trek kind of theoretical <laughs> yes and it, it's it, there's just i think not that i'm sad about this but the more that you dig into it the more questions you end up having than answers yes it's uh you know of course we have the we have the jokes, you know, the aliens drive by Earth and lock their doors uh, on their on their way past. 
Uh, of course, there's a joke, why haven't the aliens contacted us? Because, you know, we're the least interesting thing in the universe, so on and so forth. <coughs> I'm going to postulate a version that, you know, that this, this tech and this equipment is alien in nature, but it's basically, uh, you know, the, the, the alien equivalent of, uh, you know, the, the 30 year old flatbed pickup that you take out to, to, to feed the cows and yeah. uh, on their way through, they've just sort of driven the clunker through the, you know, the back 40 and have, uh, you know, stopped to observe the wildlife. And it's, it's, it's the trade in that the car lot wouldn't take. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the end of the, <laughs> we're, we're not seeing the, the apex of the technology that's available by these, uh, these civilizations. Uh, we, might, we might be seeing more of, uh, you know, mm, folks, the, the alien version of folks like us, which is stopping and feed the cows and, you know, on the way through, uh, went by the lake and, uh, you know, saw what was interesting. You know, as facetious as it is, there's a very real possibility that the the actual answers are actually much more mundane, while being hyper accelerated than we might like. Exactly, and 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 I I think that's as good a possibility as any. <laughs> there, you know, in terms of of perhaps stereotyped uh, UFO behavior, there is there does seem to be a fixation with water yeah um and you know and i've you know there's various theories some you know that maybe water is a a precious resource that they they need or that they need for fuel or their engines or something which always sounded you know okay that maybe that's plausible when we believe that water was very unique on earth and that it wasn't available other places and they're they're you know more recently they're finding there seems to be water everywhere in the universe and right. so, which again means maybe they don't need it as much and two i'm not sure what the fascination is right so there, there's there's those aspects that i i think are interesting um you know, it, again, very cliche, but it, there seems to be an obsession with cattle. Yeah. Well, I think I think it. You know, it goes back to, you know, if that can have, you know, if 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 the cow can disappear or they're mutilated and that kind of thing, then uh, in ways that we don't get, you know, mm -hmm. why would they do it that way? Then it's that primal fear of you know, what are they going to do to us? You know, what horrible torture is in store for us? It's, it, it, it's kind of like the Vikings with the blood eagle. I mean, it's just, it's great press because you terrify your enemies with the prospect you're gonna to be tortured this way. And there really isn't much um, evidence that it was ever really used, but yes. it, it sounds terrifying. It's visceral and it's horrifying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it spread, the news of it spreads really well. Now here's uh, on sort of the, the more negative aspects of, of UFO experiences uh, that, that we have documented. Something I find really fascinating is say, for example, the observation of a craft, possibly from a great distance okay. and immediately being, being seized with the sense that all that there, there's some sort of negative telepathic connection yeah um i mean i i've not had that kind of experience at all um i've i've talked to a couple of experiencers that that had that kind of experience um and i guess for me it kind of falls into two camps one that could be going on maybe there is maybe there is some sort of um uh, telepathic thing going on that um either they're getting information or controlling people's reactions the jedi mind tricks so to speak um, yes. or it could be the mind re you know uh reacting in a sort of an anxiety response to right. oh my gosh, what is this um and you know 
when people experience um, trauma or a really unusual uh, circumstance, sometimes they have these almost uh, out of body experiences or uh, awareness of a presence um, that's not explained. So maybe it's more the brain creating it. I don't know. I think <clears throat> something that that would be would be interesting to you know dig into in terms of the idea, and I think you're onto something. The idea that the the existence of the craft, or even within a prox you know proximity of say twenty miles, etc., mm -hmm. that something about the craft is is impacting our system in a way that we uh and you know for example so it might be uh proximity to some sort of electromagnetic propulsion system etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, that the brain that the we that the human physiology recognizes this isn't right well and and my my thought on that is you know there's a lot of theory going into anti gravitational um, propulsion um, using magnetism things like that and we I mean we know the that magnetism has a very powerful effect on the human body and the mind um, yes or you know EMF um, and so if if whatever is propelling these things has a um, emf sort of drive you know maybe it creates a, a strong emf field or something right um, and and people would say well you know if it's several miles away it shouldn't be able to do that well a a train will create a bubble that goes out hundreds of yards and if you're creating something that would be powerful enough to fly something through the air and maybe through space uh probably is stronger than that so yeah you know may, maybe it is creating a emf bubble of some sort or affecting gravity or something in a way that our brain recognizes there's something different going on yes <clears throat> and i think that that is i think interesting because again a lot of negative experiences related to observation of craft mm -hmm. relate something similar there's something wrong there's something off uh, the brain is translating that you know for example it's aware of me it's looking at me um it it mm -hmm. sees me it and, and then being being seized with a sense of extreme fear well and, and that's very similar to people's reaction in a, in a high emf field and often um with paranormal activity that uh, mm -hmm. that is experienced in the presence of high emf you know you have uh sensations of a presence uh even hallucinations auditory and visual um uh you know paranoia being watched or followed um uh hearing th hearing voices things like that so um I mean, if it happens to us in our house, yes. Then, if you've got something else that is creating probably a lot more than your, you know, your refrigerator is ever going to create, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can see a similar reaction that you know that may account for that. Yeah. The 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 irony, of course, is that you know that we might be observing the uh either the interdimensional or interstellar version of anything from a carnival cruise ship to a combine uh and you know we're down on the ground freaking out that it's you know it's come for us and we're really just you know our minds are inadvertently interacting with its propulsion system well exactly i mean it well i mean very often on paranormal investigations uh you have to worry about either you know someone's computer or a refrigerator is produces more emf than just about anything in your house so i mean it it, it could be the equivalent of a flying refrigerator 
Yes. <laughs> Which could be fun. You know, I think <laughs> I, I uh, you know, either either through, uh, you know, posting comments or uh, direct messaging us if you, you prefer to keep things private. Mm -hmm. I, I would encourage people to, to share their experiences. I, I, I do too. Um, and yeah, we, we'll keep your privacy if you want. Um, and, uh, but uh, we are interested in experience, people's experiences and um, we'll do our best to answer any questions as well. Yes. And of course, you know, anything from <coughs> the gamut of the categories, I either just, you know, experiences here in the Ozarks to, you know, experiences uh, simply of, of unemotionally impacted observable data mm -hmm. to, to things more in the, the, the shamanistic realm mm -hmm. uh, to things that seem to be in very negative experiences that perhaps were very frightening. Any mm -hmm. and all, um, of course, we do, a lot, you know, we joke about a lot of things uh, on, on a regular basis. But I do want to, to really hit home the fact that individuals' experiences that you choose to share with us, we take those very seriously. Uh, we take the confidentiality of those very seriously if you, you know, ask us to and, and, and specify that. And uh, th there's no reason that whether the experience was positive or negative, that it should be isolating. It should not be something that, that, that prevents, uh, you know, you from from interacting with others it should not be something that is ostracizing and right. there should be stigma attached to an encounter that you of course had nothing to do with you simply were there in that spot at that time exactly and <coughs> um, so we do encourage you know anyone that does want to talk or has questions to do so um and we do take them very very seriously we don't Absolutely. take ourselves seriously, but we no. take you seriously. <laughs> yes, it's an important distinction. Uh, we're just we're just having fun, but it's it, I think it's it's fascinating topics. There's, there's just a series of really interesting aspects to this, and I don't see any, I, I don't see an end in sight. I don't see a point that it will stop being interesting uh, or, or really, quite frankly, mysterious. We keep getting these uh, you know these announcements that. Uh, that the you know various classified agencies are going to divulge something and you know we, we get 500 pages and it's all blocked out so yeah although I mean they have really they have released quite a bit of video in the last couple of years that um, you know admitting that they, that there are things going on that they are interacting with the military is that they can't explain so um, yes that at least is a step past uh it's uh cottonwood bloom this is very true i think an important step yeah the the f8 f a 18 f 18a footage uh from the south from the pacific mm -hmm. um just a handful of years ago very very compelling data and of course yeah. confirmed footage of a of a submersible and then air to apparently space craft that uh, was pursued by uh, Navy pilots mm -hmm. and, uh, and acted in ways that uh, terrestrial man-made stuff that we know about and apparently that the US Navy knows about doesn't act like. Exactly, which pairs up with, you know, like my experience and a lot of other people's experiences. So yes, you know, if you've had that experience, you're not in it alone. No, no, and I think that's, I think that's important. Uh, we have already seen the largely the destigmatization associated with hauntings, mm -hmm. and, and I'm I'm hopeful that we're going to see over the next you know, ten to twenty years, uh, heavily destigmatization in regards to individuals who have experienced UFOs. I think I think we're heading that direction, and in the military releasing those videos, I think is a good step in that way. That you know, there may not be a good explanation at this point, but at least you know you're not crazy for having seen something. Is, right, is, is where we're at. And I, so I that admission. Yeah, and and I think that will help to dispel uh, a certain amount of paranoia within the uh, the UFO community. I hope so. Mm-hmm.
<laughs> and that may be a good place for us to end. Absolutely. Uh, we thank everybody for joining us. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe, click the notification bell, any of the things that one does on social media to see, stay up to date with current social media. And we appreciate all and we'll be back next week. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone.